Hi, welcome or welcome back to our conversations here at Providence Church around suicide awareness and prevention. Um, in this segment, we'll be talking with Ralph Cook, a co-founder of Lantern Lane Farms. Ralph, uh, you have been such a good friend to me over the years. We've been able to share in ministry together in various ways, and um, you've helped me out along the way many, many times. And I love your heart, and I love um, how I've seen God use you to impact this particular community. And I'm so, I'm so glad that you're here to be able to share in this conversation with us today. I, I was looking back at your at your history, and I know you started in music and in education. You were uh, working in the church, and then God called you to this particular kind of, of work of working with, with individuals and with families, um, and you're having a huge impact. And I'm so glad that you're faithful in listening to that call from God and able to be here with us today. Thank you, Mark. It's great to be here, and I love Providence Church. Um, before we get started in the conversation, I want to remind you that there is a, if you're watching live with us right now, there is a click here for live prayer button, and you'll have somebody there available to pray with you. Um, so we'd love for you to do that while, while we're in conversation today. Um, Ralph, as you know, um, as we begin the, this conversation, um, there, we're just going to start off the top by, by um, mentioning a, a resource that's really, really important, and it's been shared in some of our other conversations as well, um, that if you are in need of a crisis counselor right now in this moment, you can text the word HOME to 741-741, the word HOME to 741 741- 741. You'll receive a text back and be able to connect with somebody in that way. And we'll have a couple of other opportunities for you to um, to reach out to other others for help as well as we continue to talk today. Um, but Ralph, you know, there is this, um, this sense, sometimes I get to the end of the day and I just feel like recently, like there's this heaviness, you know, there's this thing that we're feeling that we can't identify and we can't really name. And sometimes I get kind of, I personally just get kind of stuck wondering, like, where is this coming from? Why am I feeling this. And then I reflect back on the last year that we've had, and it seems like actually it probably makes sense that there's just this kind of sense of, of heaviness that's kind of hanging over our homes and over our town and maybe just over ourselves. And, you know, so a year ago, we had a tornado that hit this community right here um, and, and caused all kinds of devastation. And then we went right into the, to the pandemic. And in the midst of the pandemic, we've been have, experiencing isolation and depression and um, people have been turning to other other things to to find to try to find a way out of that or to cope with that, and it's led to a lot of destruction of relationships and and brokenness in in hearts in this time. And so that's just been a really heavy heavy thing. And in the midst of that, we've just we've been hearing more and more about um, the epidemic of of suicide, how it's impacting. Um, it seems like especially our our young people in our community. It's hit us here and right here in our community, and it seems like it's nationwide probably even a global epidemic that we're experiencing in a really hard time. Um, as you've kind of lived in the middle of this and as somebody who provides care and help uh, to folks who are experiencing this, um, what are some trends that you're, that you're seeing in, in, just in the world around you and, and maybe in your practice? Yeah, so what we've noticed is the people who are already struggling with issues or having relationship issues, people who are struggling with depression, anxiety, um, a whole plethora of issues, the the pandemic has just made it more pronounced and it's even more difficult. It's harder uh, because of the isolation. It's harder because it's, it's it's hard to reach out and get help sometimes. You have to be a little more intentional about that. And um, so, you know, the, the statistics that I'm going to share are not to, my intent is not to create angst or fear with parents. But I do want parents to understand that this is a very serious issue. And when, um, with, with teens, especially these days, it's important that, that they pay attention and attend well to what's going on in their, their students' lives. And so some of the trends, and, and this comes from prior to the pandemic, um, according to the 2019 CDC report, overall, overall suicides is the second leading cause of death for our youth ages 10 to 24. In ages 10 to 14, we have seen an alarming increase in suicides. The number of suicides for this group has doubled since 2006, making it the second leading cause of death for that age group. More teenagers and young adults die from suicide than from cancer, heart disease, AIDS, birth defects, stroke, pneumonia, influenza, and chronic lung disease combined. Each day in our nation, there's an average of over 3,000 
703 attempts by young people, grades 9 through 12. Four out of five teens who attempt suicide also have given clear warning signs. And in our nation, we lose an average of more than 130 young people each week to suicide. So the statistics are alarming. Yeah, it's a crisis. It's, yes. we're, we're in the middle of a crisis. Yeah. So what are, um, so we're, we're hearing some of this. What, what are some of the, um, some more about the, like this, the warning signs or risk factors that we might be looking for as parents or just as um, elders in the community? So some of the, some of the risk factors, the warning signs would be depression. Um, that's the, that's the leading cause of suicide attempts. Um, anger, increased irritability when we are um, sometimes quarantined and we have to stay in our house, we can't leave the house. Uh, it creates this, this feeling of hostility, um, especially if, if you're in a house where the relationships are already um, not that great. Um, warning signs, another warning sign is just a lack of interest. Uh, if you have a teenager who was passionate about dancing or horseback riding or um, cheerleading or football, and all of a sudden they're no longer interested, it's a warning sign. Um, a sudden increase or decrease in appetite. Um, sudden changes in appearance. Uh, not dressing like they typically would. Uh, poor hygiene dwindling academic performance that may not be that may be a little more than just what's happening typically mm -hmm. with with students who are dealing with online classes um, preoccupation with death and suicide previous suicide attempts um, and then students making final final arrangements like planning their funeral or giving things away writing letters to friends about them not, not being there. Um, and the warning signs and the risk factors, they really, um, there's, some, there's some crossover here, but again, risk factors would be depression, mental illness, substance abuse, uh, aggression and fighting, uh, the home environment, if there are some difficult things going on in the home, uh, maybe it's a family member who is terminally ill, or maybe there's a divorce taking place, uh, that environment um, is, is a risk factor. Um, the community environment, uh, the school environment, previous attempts, um, and again, the, the stressors in the family, and then the situational crisis. Um, we often ignore things that are, that are big to teens. Uh, we, we ignore them and we, uh, we, mm. we kind of minimize them. If there was a breakup, well, there's, there's, there's another boy or there's another girl. You'll always find somebody else. We minimize them rather than really allowing that, that, that teenager, that student to grieve the, their losses. Right. So there's, there's often situational crises that become a risk factor. Yeah. Just hearing you name those things, I think it helps us to realize that, oh, th like this, this is real. This is here. Um, these don't even actually, some of these things don't really sound like all that out of the ordinary. And so um, as parents, we typically are hopefully would want to be the ones at, at least that know our children the best, that know, know them as they are, know like the things that they love, their passions, the things that they just get up in the morning thinking about. And so we, that we would hope we'd be able to be the ones that would know when there's a shift in that, even if it's subtle, away from, wait, they're getting up in the morning and something is different about them now. Um, how do we begin to engage with even the subtle changes that we're seeing? Well, first of all, I think it's so important that parents know their teens. So I, I can't tell you how important it is that there's intentionality in building relationship, being really proactive in relationship with the teens. Um, we, we don't have family dinners together often. We don't sit down and play games together often. Um, the pandemic has actually created some of that where we've, we are spending more time together because we have to. So some of that's positive and some of it's not so positive. But, but really leaning into getting to know, going into the, your, your 
teen's world, having an understanding of who they are and what they do and understanding their culture, asking, asking questions without judgment, um, really getting understanding um, with, without the judgment, getting understanding before offering solution. We're really quick as parents often to say, you know, you shouldn't do that or you should do this. But before we can offer those solutions, it's really important that we have understanding and we really are very intentional about building relationship with our teens. Sounds like there's a, a call to, to risking a little bit as a parent because we're entering into a world that isn't a culture that isn't necessarily just our own, but we're, um, I feel like you're calling us to, to kind of risk being able to enter into that and risk being a little bit goofy <laughs> and being a little yes. bit out of place. Yes. It's, it's not often going to be helpful to make statements like, I know what you're going through because I was a teenager once. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, it's not very helpful. Uh, it would be much better to be able to lean in and get understanding of where your teen is today and understanding the, the specific differences <laughs> between what, what we've experienced and what they're experiencing today yeah. because it is very different, obviously. I'm going to walk into a little bit of a, maybe a, a touchy um, area, and you mentioned this on one of our, our previous talks as well, but um, what are the how do we know the boundaries of privacy for our kids when um, we, want to know, we want to know what's happening in their world? We feel like maybe they're not talking to us and telling us everything, um, and so we're, we're tempted to go and maybe look into le electronic communica communications, or um, how, how, how do we navigate that as parents? Well, I think we do everything we can to pr protect privacy of our teens. However, as parents, we have the responsibility to know what's going on in our, in our, in our teen's life. So uh, there is a fine line there. But when it comes to the safety of your teenager, then sometimes we have to, we have to cross over into what they may feel is, is private. So knowing, knowing what's going on on social media, um, knowing passwords, um, being able to, to access email accounts and that kind of thing. Um, often our, our, our teens can, can have that opportunity to teach us that they could be trusted. Um, so it depends on the teenager. If they are consistently violating that trust, then we have, we have more of a, uh, I think a responsibility to to be prudent in looking for and making sure that our kids are safe. So, if we've seen some of these warning signs, these risk risk factors have led to warning signs, and maybe even have some confirmation in, it, or maybe not, um, but we really feel like we're at a, at a decision place of needing to make a next step. What are some of those next steps that we can take as parents? Well, so first of all. Hopefully you've built that really strong relationship, um, talking with the kids, um, sitting with them without judgment. Uh, again, you don't have to have you don't have to have a statement for everything. Letting 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 your teens talk to you, letting them letting them share, and even answering by by saying, you know what, that's a that's a really interesting point you've made there. I'd like to have some time to think about that. And, and could we get back and, and talk about that? That's, that's creating that safety. But even sometimes in the, the best case scenario, and we're doing everything we can to build relationship, for some reason, the teenager doesn't feel safe to talk, talk, talk about everything with their parents. So being intentional about setting up a safe place for them, whether it's with a, with a pastor, youth pastor, a therapist, um, I think it's, I think, well, I'm a little biased here, but I think everybody should have a therapist um, so that, so that when, when we encounter hard times, we already have that relationship built and we're able to, to go to that person. Um, so, you know, engaging, engaging a therapist to work with your team. And um, Anna shared earlier that it's, it's important for us as parents not to be uh, jealous or, envious because our kids are talking to someone else versus us, especially, obviously, if that person is a safe person. Yeah. Well, we mentioned off the top um, a specific resource, um, texting the word home to 741-741. 
Um, are there a couple of other specific um, places to go that, um, that you have found to be helpful and, and trusted? Yes. The Jason's Foundation is a great resource. There are tons of resources on there for, uh, that, that help us in, in finding those. Um, it's a great resource for parents who want to be more educated about suicide and for their, uh, for their teens. The other, the other resource that I want to mention, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, is 1-800-273-TALK. It's 1-800-273-TALK. And then there is a, there's an organization called the, the Trevor Foundation, which is really specifically for the LGBTQ community and for, for kids who are struggling. Uh, and that number is one 866 488 Seven three eight six. So, for parents who who may need more information and have a better understanding of their child who may have disclosed to them, um, that's that's a that's a great resource. So important to be able to have have places to go. Um, I know you've, you've mentioned Lantern, Lantern Lane Farms is a great resource. Churches are are available to guide guide folks to places, and there are in those moments. Here's a number that you can call um, to to reach out. Um, in, in shifting gears a little bit, Ralph, I, um, I know that there are a lot of there's a, a lot of the conversations that you might be having in your home with your with your kids. Um, you might have a child who's never experienced any of these kind of feelings, but this is a topic of conversation in school, in church, in home, as it should be. We need to be talking about this. Um, so, as as a parent who's inexperienced in talking about that, how do we how do we begin to broach that subject? I, I think we, I think we ask we ask uh, probing questions uh, when 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 there is a tragedy when there is a crisis and there's a student who has taken their life. What we don't want to do is just ignore that. Mm. And often I think people are concerned. Well, if I talk to my kids about it, will that put something in their mind? Will they uh, actually? It, it would have the opposite effect. And in talking with them asking them how they're doing, asking them how they're feeling, and listening without giving input, but, but just staying present, creates this atmosphere of, it's okay to talk about my feelings. It's, it's all right to do that. So um, it's something that, that needs to be talked about. Do we want to talk about it as a fun topic? No, it's not. But it's something that, that absolutely has to be talked about. And the fact is that it is being talked about. So, in, in the home, we can have a healthy, healthy approach to that. Exactly. Excellent. Well, and I know that um, a lot of our young people are trying to trying to figure out just how are how are we going? How are we going to um, talk about this? How am I going to deal with this? Um, even a, occasionally, a student will have a friend that is is they've heard threatened to commit suicide. Um, how how does how do we help our children who are figuring out? Do I report this? Who do I talk to? Um, can, Talk about how we would help them through that. Yeah. We're always going to go towards safety. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to always encourage our, our student. To, if, 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 if they have a friend who indicates that they're at risk, then we want to encourage them to report to someone safe, the principal, uh, assistant principal, to parents so that they can take care of it, or a youth pastor who's safe so that they can make, make the report. But we, but encouraging them that that's the right thing to do, and actually, it's what we're we're required to do yeah. in the state of, of Tennessee. We're mandated reporters, so when we, if we hear that someone is considering hurting themselves, um, we're required to report that. I'm going to err on the side of safety. Yes. In all the situations. Um, I've had some. We've heard some questions from from parents, and um, some of some of those questions are just around the idea of differentiating between. Because um, we talked about it from the top, like we're all experiencing stress and we're experiencing anxiety, and the world's been a little bit turned upside down, right, for a while. So how do we how do we just distinguish, differentiate, really, between um, watching our kids work through stress and normal stress and anxiety of school and all that, and something more? Again, it's this dialogue. The dialogue, the talking, is so important. It's it's hearing from them. It's asking tough questions. It's it's allowing it's it's creating the safe place uh, for them for them to talk. There's also this sense in which um, 
we wonder if our if our if our child is hiding depression, you know, that masking it somehow so that we can't see it. Um, yet we want to investigate. We want to we want to find out more. Um, how how does that conversation happen in the home? Well, it can it can certainly be masked, and we all, adults and teens, know how to wear masks and hide our depression. Uh, but I think normalizing, and over the past year, I think that's one of the things that, that we have had more pro- probably more conversations with clients about is normalizing the stress that they're experiencing and the anxiety. It makes sense that you would be feeling that rather than uh, suck it up and move on. And so, so letting letting our teens or helping helping our teens understand that it's normal that you would feel this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when there's a crisis at school or in the community or in our world, um, normalizing what they're feeling rather than um, minimizing it. Sure. Well, Ralph, um, as we've been talking talking through this this conversation, I think probably a lot of us, as we hear it, as we as we share in this, we're thinking through personal stories um, and, uh, of suicide, maybe in our community. Um, I've experienced it in my family, and I have experienced it, like a lot of people have, it as something that we don't we don't really talk about, we don't really process out out loud, and so we kind of sit with it, and it just kind of sits inside of us um, until we're invited into a conversation like we're being invited to right here. And um, I, it feels really healthy to be able to say, okay, this is, this is a real thing. And looking forward, I want to, I want to be a part of the solution. I want to be a part of a, of a culture in which it's okay to talk about. Um, Ralph, I would love it if you would just kind of share, if you have had an experience of this in your life, have you lost somebody to suicide? Yes, I have. Um, in the situation that I'm thinking about, uh, the young man who took his life um, was inebriated, and so it clouded his decision making. And I really believe that had he not been, um, he wouldn't have made he wouldn't have made that decision. Um, and so when 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 you have teens that are are covering up and they're medicating because they don't have a safe place to talk, um, it can it can become very dangerous because it it almost creates a um, an atmosphere where it, it would be okay to do this. They're not. They're not thinking clearly, and that's that's what I've experienced with with the people that I've that I've known who have taken their life. The devastation that it leaves for the family is unbelievable. Um, and for those those people who may be listening, who who have had a family member who has taken their life. Um, it's it's really important to have people in your life that you're walking alongside um, and holding hope for you, holding beliefs like it wasn't your fault mm-hmm. until you can hold it for yourself. Um, it's so so incredibly important uh, that you have that you have your community, that you have su- a support network around you. Yeah. Seems like part of part of the grief of living through. Um, an experience where somebody you love has committed suicide is you were you were and can imagine what their future would have been what their what the trajectory of their life that could have you know beautiful things were ahead for them and, and we we can picture that and um, I, I wonder if for young people and seeing um, being around this conversation is is helping to say what I can see right now is just like this next little bit I can see to the next curve in the road but I can't see what the fullness of what God has for me beyond that. Um, maybe in your personal life or in, in, your, um, in your practice, are, are there some, some instruments, some exercises where you have been able to help young, young people, especially kind of see beyond that, that short vision that we have of the immediate to the beautiful life that God has for us? Actually, just recently I was sitting with a client and helping them look into the future a little bit. Um, at first I was afraid maybe it would be overwhelming, but it was actually, he reported that it was, it brought peace to him because he was able to, to look over that, that hump that he's at right now where he can't see over, but he, he understand, he understood that he has potential, that there is hope, that he is smart, that he can make it. Um, so, um, often 
holding, again, holding that hope for them until they can hold that hope for themselves and being yeah. present, providing non-anxious presence. And, and that's, you know, as, as far as parents are concerned, um, if, if, your, if your students come and, and talk to you, then whatever you do, don't panic. Stay present. Stay with them. You can do this. You can. You there's a a world of help out there for you. You can you can reach out and get help. And often I think parents will say, "I don't know how to do. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to deal with this." Well, I'm not for sure anybody <laughs> knows exactly how to deal with it because, um, yeah, you've never you've never had this situation happen. So, um, but there's plenty of help out there. Yeah. That's beautiful imagery. Beautiful words. Holding out the hope for them until they can hold it for themselves. It's kind of the job of being a parent, I guess. I feel like it's continuing to, to do that when, and then maybe sometimes, some in the best times we do that for each other, maybe our kids do that for us from time to time as well. We're holding out hope for one another. We've talked about how this season has, has just, it's been hard for everybody. And so as parents, and we watching our young people struggle and not always knowing the right thing to do, um, where is help for for us? Where, where where can parents go for help? Well, same place. I think reaching out to to therapists who specialize in working with with parents, and couples, and adults, and processing the the fears and the anxieties that they may be having, and just raising teens in this culture today and in, in this society. Um, again, being proactive in um, having that person in place so that as bumps come, they, they have that, that person they can go to and have conversations with and kind of sort out and process. Um, it's, it's really important. Whether, and again, whether it's, a, whether it's a, a pastor or a therapist or just a really good friend that you can be honest with, but, but parents don't need to carry this alone. Mm-hmm. They, the, it's really important that they have their community, they have their support network. It's so important. Ralph, I want to thank you for, for spending time with us in this conversation. And as we've said all along, it, it is a conversation that continues. And um, we don't have it all figured out. But um, parents, one thing that we have just heard over and over again is that you, I'm talking to myself here too, we are not alone in, in, this, in this journey because we, we love our children, we love our communities, we love our, our families, and God loves us through all of this. And so um, we need to stay in this together. We need to um, continue this great conversation, this great work of, of loving people to life. So thank you for, for being a part of that. One time before we go, just remember um, one of our resources we lifted up is to, that you can text the word home to 741-741 if you're in need of crisis counseling um, right now. Thank you so much for spending time with us, Ralph. We love you. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me.